We went in there not knowing. Was this an accident that never, you know, is very an anomaly, would never happen again, it's only this company, or, you know, was there something deeper going on? And although the American Petroleum Institute would have you believe that it was an anomaly, we actually found something very different. We believe that uh, it's really a systemic problem, that the industry, uh, although very, very sophisticated, and I can't emphasize how sophisticated it and how complex it is and uh, really the amazing engineering capacity that they have for the deep water environment. But they don't have a, a series of industry-wide standards, operating standards, that are based on the best safety practices uh, that are uniform across the industry. So you know, there's tremendous variation. You know, our recommendation was that the entire industry has to be brought up to a standard that is the highest safety standard that can be realized. And that the Interior Department has a major responsibility, the primary responsibility, for ensuring that that happens. But that in addition to the Interior Department, the industry itself has to create a series of standards and literally self-police. That's what the aviation industry does, that's what the nuclear industry does, and one would have assumed that an industry as sophisticated as the oil and gas industry would do that as well, and it turns out they don't. Actually, in both the UK and in Norway, offshore oil and gas operations are managed according to these, this kind of safety case risk assessment practice that we're recommending. So the industry, many of the same companies, are doing it in other countries. Why not here? You know, isn't this the United States of America? We should have the highest standards of safety. We should be setting the international standard. And it turns out we're not. And that was very, very surprising. Probably the most, um, the richest part of the experience in many ways were the trips to the Gulf. Because, you know, these are communities. These are people. These are wonderful resources and communities with a history and a richness that, first of all, is really fun and a privilege to get to see. You know, once you meet those people and you hear those stories and then you understand what the impact of this has been on their lives. And I've been, I mean, now we're in January and I've been talking for the last couple of days to people we met down there to tell them a little bit about what's in the report. And this is just as vivid for them in many ways today as it was in April. You know, they're still reeling from the impacts about this. So, you know, from my point of view, when we were, you know, kind of in the conference rooms in D.C. trying to work through the recommendations to be mindful of, you know, who was impacted here. And the fact that this is, you know, as the rest of the country may have forgotten about this or it's gotten kind of off the front page for them, that there are thousands of people who continue to be affected on a day-to-day -day basis. And, you know, those are the shrimpers and the people in the tourism industry, also the people in the oil industry who want to get back to business as usual. And, you know, we think they can if they adopt, uh, you know, a higher level of standards practice.